I feel a little weird giving this talk because everyone's done like kind of technical programming stuff and here I am talking about space, but I think space is really cool. And uh, everyone who's friends with me knows I'm a little insane about it. So I'm going to talk to you about astrophotography, which is um, something that I've kind of gotten into in the last year or two. Uh, and I think it's kind of cool. So maybe you'll think it's kind of cool too. And if not, you can shame me or something. Um, so <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so as you probably can guess, astrophotography is taking pictures of stuff in space. Uh, you don't actually need the Hubble Space Telescope or go out to the deserts of Chile with a really powerful telescope to take cool pictures. Uh, you can take cool pictures of space from right here in uh, Florida, in Orlando. And uh, so why on earth would you do that kind of thing? Um, well, space is cool and uh, you might appreciate it a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> and also the girl or guy that might like you or you might like. Uh, might appreciate your sort of newfound knowledge of the cosmos. Uh, and if Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, you meet him on the street, you can fist bump and be like, hey, bro, I know about space. And he'll be like, yeah, man, that's so cool. Um, <clears throat> and if you're like me, there's like a plethora of pictures of babies on Facebook. So this makes it a little more interesting for you <laughs> and them. <laughs> uh, so the stuff that's not so cool about astrophotography, uh, there's an inherent level of unpredictability just because you're kind of slave to the weather. Uh, and, you know, the weatherman can only be uh, so predictable. So um, this gets especially annoying if there's like a cool thing that's happening. You know, we had the lunar eclipse like a week and a half ago. Uh, we were actually the only spot on the East Coast that had uh, a view of it because the rest of the East Coast was covered in clouds. So uh, if the cloud gods are frowning on you in some manner, uh, you don't get to look at space. And that's kind of sad. Um, <clears throat> uh, so with, similar with light pollution. Um, unfortunately, that's harder and harder to avoid unless you live in the middle of nowhere. And uh, thankfully, we don't really live in the middle of nowhere, which is great, except when you want to look at stuff that's really dim in the sky. Uh, and you kind of need to go out a little further from civilization to kind of uh, see the really cool stuff. But uh, fear not, you can actually see quite a bit of really neat stuff uh, even here in uh, light polluted Orlando. And uh, much like a lot of hobbies, um, this can actually get really expensive really quickly. But you don't need to drop a ton of money in order to take cool pictures. Uh, that's the good news. <clears throat> um, so as you can guess, uh, one of the big factors with astrophotography or taking pictures of stuff is how bright they are. Um, <clears throat> so that ba basically the brightness of any celestial object kind of determines how easy it is to take pictures of, uh, just as kind of a general rule. Um, Obviously, the more uh, light something produces, uh, much with the traditional camera, you know, the less exposure you have to do with that object, uh, the more data you have to work with. As you can guess, uh, the moon is the easiest thing to take pictures of. It's really bright when it's actually in the sky. Uh, if you have a cheap telescope, if a friend of yours has a cheap telescope that's collecting dust in the basement, maybe you can borrow it for a bit. Uh, you can pull out your iPhone and hold the iPhone camera up to the eyepiece, and more often than not, you can kind of take sweet pictures with that and uh, replace some of the babies on Facebook with pictures of the moon. It's kind of cool. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and you can also you know, take other cool pictures of the moon, too, uh, with a decent uh, camera. That's one that I took about two weeks ago. Uh, getting a little dimmer, uh, planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is generally one of the brightest objects in the sky when the moon isn't up. Uh, Saturn's a little dimmer. Uh, it's not always up, either. Uh, it's actually up right now. This is kind of becoming the best time of the year to see Saturn. Uh, it's probably up right about now, kind of low in the eastern sky. I can show it to you guys outside afterwards if you want. Uh, unfortunately, the text at the bottom got cut off. Anyways, um, <clears throat> so with uh, you don't really need a powerful instrument to see some cool stuff on Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, if you have a really small telescope, even some binoculars, you can kind of see some cool stuff. A uh, pretty low-powered telescope would let you see kind of the cloud bands on Jupiter and some of its moons. Uh, same thing with Saturn. You can see the rings on it pretty easily. Um, if you don't have access to a telescope, uh, if you just have like a cheap tripod, you can get one for 15 bucks off Amazon. That works pretty well. Uh, and you have a decent lens, you can start taking some cool pictures of the stars, you know, wide field. Uh, you don't need really long exposure times for that. Uh, typically, cameras will give you a shutter time of, you know, 20 or 30 seconds that's usable, and you can get some cool stuff with that. You just have to make sure you don't touch the camera and let it do its, let it do its thing. Uh, anyways. <clears throat> Uh, when we start getting to really dim objects like galaxies and nebula and distant star clusters, uh, you're going to need some more powerful equipment, uh, which is kind of outside the scope of this talk. I'll talk about it a little bit, though, afterwards, if you want. Uh, so one of the big rules with astrophotography is there isn't kind of one like ultimate solution. Uh, a really nice telescope that you have or a really nice uh, set of equipment may not work for everything quite the same way. 
Uh, the kind of stuff that you take pictures of the moon with may not be the same kind of thing that would get you really cool pictures of the Andromeda Galaxy or, you know, the Orion Nebula. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about telescopes because when people think of space and looking at space and taking pictures of space, they think of telescopes. And uh, it kind of gives you a, a nice foundation for some of the concepts that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so there are pretty much two principal parts of a telescope to consider. One is the optics, which is actually what it uses to see stuff. And uh, the other thing is the mount, which is actually how the telescope moves, how it can track objects across the sky, which is actually a really important factor. Um, so I'm going to go real quick through this. Uh, and just kind of touch on it brief, but basically there are three kinds of telescope optics out there. There's refractor, which was actually the first kind of telescope invented. Uh, Galileo used a refractor, and it's basically using curved pieces of glass as a lens, which basically focuses light. Uh, reflectors use curved mirrors to focus light in kind of the same way. And uh, catadioptrics, I think that's how I'm pronouncing it. Uh, they're generally fancier computer-controlled telescopes that use a combination of both to get really cool images. Um, this is, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. That's an example of a reflector telescope that's actually the kind that the Hubble Space Telescope uses. Uh, so it's got a big kind of donut shaped mirror and then a smaller secondary mirror and that's what it uses to focus light. So, you know, even something out in space taking pictures of space uses the same concept as a telescope you use on the ground. Uh, the last thing that's important about telescopes to consider is something called aperture, which is basically the size of the primary mirror or lens. Uh, generally, the wider the aperture of it, the more powerful it is, the more it can see, uh, the more distant things it can see. Uh, that's not kind of a hard and fast rule. Uh, aperture isn't everything. It's kind of like horsepower on a car, you know. Uh, you can go 0 to 60 really fast, but if you can't go around corners very well, you know, it may not be the best car in the world. Anyways. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, going into mounts the telescopes uses. Uh, there are two main kinds that I'm going to talk about. The first and the most basic is called alt-azimuth mounts. Uh, you see alt-azimuth mounts everywhere, not just on telescopes, basically a camera tripod. Uh, anything that's kind of sitting where it can turn and it can pitch up and down, that's an alt-azimuth mount, basically. Uh, this is an example of a Dobsonian telescope. It's the one that I have at home. Uh, so basically, you can turn it to rotate, face any way, and pitch it up and down, uh, which is cool and easy. but. Um, gets kind of hard to look at things in the sky, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, the more advanced of the two is called an equatorial mount. Um, <clears throat> it has two uh, different axes of movement, but they are slightly tilted. Um, I don't have anything to, uh, to use as an example, so I'm going to use my arm. So let's pretend the arm is the mount. Uh, this is your telescope thing. Uh, with an alt-azimuth mount, you know, you're rotating it like this. You can look in different parts of the sky. You can pitch it up and down. An equatorial mount is actually tilted slightly, uh, and you still have two axes that it can move on. It can rotate like this, and it can rotate like this. Uh, this rotation is called right ascension. This rotation is called declination. Uh, those have very specific meanings that I'll go into in a minute, but kind of keep that in mind. Uh, in this case, uh, this bar right here, um, the way it turns this way is right ascension, and then the way this turns is declination. Uh, that'll make more sense in a second. Um, but that is more, um, it's easier to track things in the sky using a, a mount like this, even though it's a little harder to understand, a little harder to set up. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, something that you'll notice pretty quickly when you're taking pictures of stars and planets and that kind of thing is that they tend to move across the sky. <laughs> uh, and it's not them moving, it's you. Uh, they do move, but not very quickly relative to the Earth. Uh, but the Earth is rotating constantly. And that movement is what causes the, sky, the stars to move across the sky uh, in a rather predictable fashion, um, which is fine. You know, if you're taking a 20-second exposure of a planet or something like that, you know, that's typically not going to affect it. Uh, if you're taking a long exposure, if you want to take a picture of a distant nebula, you need to collect a lot of light from it that requires you uh, to basically have it still in the frame for a long period of time. Kind of like if you're taking a picture with a camera of something at night, uh, you want it on a tripod, you want to not touch it for a little bit so it collects all the light and it's not blurry uh, when you get an image afterwards. Um, kind of think of it like taking a picture of your cat. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, the shutter speed on your camera isn't going to be fast enough to take a picture of a cat that's not just a blur. So it's a similar thing with taking pictures of stars and uh, things that are in the distance. Um, so like I said, stars move slowly across the sky. Uh, and you're going to have to be able to track them to uh, take into account how bright. Oh, goodness, that's not bright at all. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I don't think I can do much about that. Anyways, uh, so if you can kind of see, uh, there's a grid happening here. Uh, we have lines going this way, 
lines going this way. Uh, this is what's called the azimuthal grid, which is what you use if you have a basic alt-azimuth mount. Uh, it's basically, you know, you have a 360 degree circle along the horizon. Uh, if you're pointed in a given direction on the horizon, there's a, a degree basically that you're heading. Uh, you have an altitude which corresponds to basically the horizon up to the very top, which is called the zenith. Uh, that's usually zero through 90. Um, the problem is that uh, with anything in the sky, um, its coordinates on the alt azimuth grid is going to change over time. So you could say, you know, Jupiter will be at so and so degrees azimuth and so and so degrees altitude, but that will only be at, you know, 10 p.m. on a Tuesday. Uh, 30 minutes later, it'll be at a different spot in the sky. So if you're moving a telescope, you're going to have to be moving uh, in two degrees the azimuth and the altitude uh, to track anything, which is kind of annoying. <clears throat> um, an equatorial mount works a little different. Uh, and I really wish this picture was brighter. But anyways, um, stars are generally uh, located on sort of an arbitrary sphere that's projected out into space. It's called the celestial sphere. Um, unlike the zenith with an azimuthal grid, which is directly overhead from wherever you are, uh, one of the poles of the celestial sphere is located in the general vicinity of Polaris. So you can kind of think of the sphere kind of rotated slightly. Uh, and if you look north, which would be that way, so Polaris would be kind of low in the sky that way. That's one pole. Um, the sphere kind of, you know, the south pole would be below the horizon on that side, and the uh, celestial equator would be going, you know, across the sky um, about midway between the two. So what right ascension let, uh, <clears throat> what the right ascension axis lets you do is uh, with an equatorial mount, you basically uh, polar align it, where you align it to Polaris, which is the one point in the sky which never moves at night. So if you notice, stars will process across the sky, except for Polaris. Uh, if you look at the, the Little Dipper, uh, Ursa Minor, uh, it will actually rotate around Polaris because uh, the star is the tail of the little bear, basically. Um, but right ascension uh, basically helps describe uh, the movement of stars um, across the sky on that axis. So it's the rotational axis of the Earth. So um, I'm trying to think of a way to describe it. So a star. Uh, when it changes um, across the sky, uh, this is a movement across the right ascension. So what a, uh, an equatorial telescope will let you do, uh, a lot of them are motorized, so they'll actually counteract that rotation of the Earth. So they'll turn at the same rate that the Earth is turning. So they're turning on that same axis, and so the star, relative to you, relative to the view through that telescope, never changes its position, which lets you, which lets you take pictures uh, for a long period of time. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, oops, anyways, that was weird. I told it not to sleep, but I guess it didn't listen to me. <laughs> uh, degrees in right ascension or the right ascension grid are actually done in time. So it's uh, uh, 24 hours, uh, which corresponds to the rotation of the Earth, obviously. So um, if uh, an hour passes, uh, a star will move uh, one hour along that grid uh, over an hour of time. So um, on that grid, stars are actually static. So you can give um, coordinates of a star in right ascension and declination, and it will always be at those coordinates. So basically, your, your frame of reference changes, but the star's position on that sphere never changes. Um, so moving on. Uh, uh, astrophotography, uh, you're still using a camera most of the time, just a normal professional camera. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, some of the rules that you use with normal cameras still apply. Uh, if you haven't used a camera before, <laughs> uh, there are three basic things you need to know. Shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. Uh, I could do a whole talk about that, but I'm not going to. Uh, shutter speed is basically how long the, the sensor is exposed, so how long it's collecting light. Uh, ISO is a measure of sensitivity of how, uh, at least originally, it was a sensitivity of the film. Now it's the sensitivity of the, center, of the sensor. So it's basically how sensitive to light uh, the sensor is and aperture is uh, the opening, or the amount that the, the aperture is open. So if the aperture is open more, it collects more light. Uh, if the aperture is, is smaller, then it collects less light. Um, with telescopes, that doesn't really apply because you're not using a camera lens, which is what actually has the aperture. So it's whatever the telescope has. But shutter speed and ISO still matter. Um, obviously, for distant objects, you want really long shutter speeds because you're trying to collect a lot of light for that, that distant object. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things we use are filters. Uh, which basically helps uh, limit or select uh, very specific wavelengths of light to try to collect more information. Because um, you're basically trying to combine 
uh, not just visual wavelengths, but other wavelengths in order to sort of create a more complete picture of the object that you're trying to take pictures of. Um, for something like the moon, the moon is bright enough when you look at it through a telescope. Uh, you're usually going to use what's called a neutral density filter, which basically, it's like sunglasses for a telescope. It limits a lot of light coming in because the moon is really freaking bright. Uh, helps you uh, see some of the, the details on the surface, of the lunar surface, a little bit better. Uh, for planets, a lot of people use color filters because, you know, if you're looking at the entire visible spectrum, uh, you may not be able to see much, whereas if you use, like, a blue color filter or a green color filter, you may be able to see uh, more distinct features on the surface of a planet. Um, and you can collect that information and sort of combine it and create a better picture uh, than you would be able to otherwise. Uh, nebula. Uh, if you think to, I don't know if you guys have been watching the new Cosmos. It's really cool. You should if you haven't. <laughs> uh, like two weeks ago, he talked about uh, the spectrum of light and how, you know, um, a lot of objects emit uh, spectra that correspond to the actual elemental properties of whatever they're made out of. Uh, that's also true for nebula and like gas clouds in space. Uh, they emit light based on their chemical composition, which is mostly hydrogen a lot of the time. So these nebular filters actually uh, limit light to just those wavelengths of hydrogen, uh, which lets you get a more complete picture of what those, those nebula are actually consist of. Uh, it's really freaking cool, actually. <laughs> um, so to give you a better idea, uh, these are pictures of the Crab Nebula taken with different wavelengths. So the, uh, the visual wavelengths, so what you would see if you look through a telescope is the top right. Uh, but you can see if you're, use, if you're selecting um, or looking at this object through different wavelengths of light, you get a very different picture uh, if you're looking at it through ultraviolet or infrared um, or gamma or x-ray or whatever. You know, you're not going to usually have a telescope that does that or, you know, a run-of-the-mill one at Walmart. Um, but this gives you an idea of how the light that you're collecting can really affect uh, the end product of the, uh, the picture that you're trying to take. Um, <clears throat> For planets, a lot of people use a, a technique called stacking, which is basically taking a video instead of just still images. Um, this lets you take basically a lot of individual pictures that you can then stack together um, and po in post-processing, basically, and take the data from the uh, individual pictures, collect them all together, and make sort of a coherent uh, image based on uh, the best information from that whole collection. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> so how do you get all this data that you've collected about uh, celestial objects into like a final picture? Um, so a lot of astrophotographers employ uh, a fair amount of post-processing to really get like a really sweet picture. Uh, so stacking something that I talked about, uh, basically, you know, you may take a video, which is, you know, like an AVI is basically just a series of frames that, you know, 24 frames a second or whatever you're taking pictures of. So if you take, you know, a uh, uh, you know, a minute AVI, you may have several thousand frames effectively that you get to work with. Uh, some of those may have better information than others related to specific parts of the image. So what stacking software actually tries to do is align it all and take the best details from each one and sort of merge it into a more cohesive image. And what it actually does is reduce noise. So if you, uh, generally speaking, if you have a picture that's taken in low light uh, with your smartphone and you try to blow it up really big, you get like that fuzziness, that graininess, that's basically noise. It's incomplete data. Uh, stacking helps reduce that. Uh, so if you have a very small object, a very fuzzy object like a, a planet through a telescope, it helps you reduce some of that uh, noise a little bit. Uh, there's a bunch of free software out there that you can download. Unfortunately, a lot of it is Windows only, which kind of sucks, um, to help uh, stack or post-process. Uh, I listed some here, uh, PIP, AutoStacker, and Registax. Um, a lot like someone else's presentation, these are actually links that you can click on, and I have the URL at the end of this video, and I'm sure it'll be available later. So if you want to, you can check these out and click on them and uh, take a look. Um, so if you're interested in this kind of thing at all, uh, you don't need to spend a lot of money. Uh, you can get a beginner's telescope for less than the price of an iPad mini. Uh, I think the telescope that I have was like $300, which really isn't that much. And you can see a lot of really cool stuff with it. Um, there's a lot of resources, and I have a, a couple links later on um, for places where you can really look and see like what a nice beginner's telescope would be. Because um, obviously, you know, like I said, aperture is a big deal, but it's on everything. You also have to consider how easy it is to move around. If you have a small car and a really big telescope, you're probably not going to be able to take it around to a lot of places. And if it's a pain to set up and tear down, um, obviously that might affect it too. Uh, you don't always need a really nice camera either. Something like a DSLR really helps, but it's not you know, the only thing. Uh, you can get relatively cheap webcams, which are great for planetary photography for pretty cheap, $50, $100. Uh, 
Uh, you can get what are called CCD cameras, which are pretty much dedicated to astrophotography. Uh, a lot of them actually have little things that help cool the sensor to help reduce noise that's generated by heat. Um, but that those get a little expensive. But you, there are a lot of options for starting out. You don't really need to spend a lot of money just to look up and enjoy space and take cool pictures and make your Facebook feed better. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to just start looking up in the night sky at night, uh, there are a couple of resources to do that. Uh, the UCF Observatory here on campus actually has open house uh, usually once a week, sometimes every other week. Uh, it's free. You can check it out. They have like a 20-inch telescope, which is pretty big, um, that they just let people go up to and look through, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> um, the Bueller Planetarium up at the Seminole State College also has uh, some telescopes, uh, and they do a lot of free sort of planetarium events. Uh, they have an astronomy day next month, which is going to be really sweet. Uh, the guys up there are really cool. Um, if you don't want to go anywhere, but you just kind of want to look and see what it's, what's in the night sky, uh, there's this planetarium app and Stellarium. Uh, both are free software that you can use to kind of figure out what's what and what's up in the sky at a given time of night. Um, some additional resources. Uh, Backyard Astronomer's Guide is a great book. Uh, it's a telescope you may actually enjoy, or a, a telescope, a textbook you may actually enjoy reading for once, um, and you won't have to return it. It's a good investment. Uh, there are a bunch of subreddits related to astrophotography and astrobin. It's like Flickr, but for astrophotography. It's kind of sweet. Um, anyways, so uh, this talk is available at that link. You can hit me up at all the usual places. I love talking about this kind of thing, so I'm happy to nerd out with other people later if you want. Uh, and that's all I got. So thank you.